Today, applications submitted in anemias and of a biosimilar, a European approval in breast cancer, and breast cancer screening guidance statements issued by the American College of Physicians. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. A supplemental biologics license application has been submitted to the FDA for Lucepatercept for the treatment of adult patients with very low to intermediate risk myelodysplastic syndrome associated anemia with ring sideroblasts who require red blood cell transfusions and also for adult patients with beta thalassemia associated anemia who require such transfusions. The application is based on findings from the phase three medalist and belief studies which show that treatment with Lucepetercept led to RBC transfusion independence in patients with MDS-associated anemia, as well as significant reductions in RBC transfusion burden in those with beta thalassemia-associated anemia. In Metalist, results showed that 37.9% of patients treated with Lucepetercept experienced RBC transfusion independence for eight or more weeks, compared with 13.2% in the placebo arm. In the BELIEVE trial, 21.4% of patients in the Lispetercept arm achieved a 33% or higher reduction in transfusion burden, with a reduction of two or more RBC units. During weeks 13 to 24, when compared with a 12-week baseline period versus 4.5% of those on placebo. Specifically, 19.6% of patients on Lucepetercept achieved a 33% or higher reduction in RBC transfusion burden at weeks 37 to 48, compared with 3.6% of those receiving placebo. A biologics license application has been resubmitted to the FDA for the Pegfilgrastin biosimilar LAEP2006 to decrease the incidence of infection from febrile neutropenia in patients with non-myeloid malignancies who are receiving myelosuppressive anti-cancer therapy. The resubmission addresses a complete response letter the FDA issued in June 2016. With the resubmission, the application includes new data from a pivotal single-dose three-period crossover pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic study comparing Sandoz Pegfilgrastim biosimilar with U.S. sourced reference Pegfilgrastim, the Pegfilgrastim biosimilar with European Union sourced reference Pegfilgrastim, and U.S. with EU sourced reference Pegfilgrastim. At the time of the 2016 CRL, Sandoz has stated that it was working with the FDA to address remaining questions. Investigators from the Phase I trial noted that due to historically known high intra- and inter-subject variabilities with reference biologic in area under the serum concentration time curve, the study is appropriate and establishes the scientific bridge to demonstrate similarity of PK and PD, safety, and immunogenicity between LAEP2006, EU reference Pegfilgrastim, and US reference Pegfilgrastim. As of October 2018, the trial was ongoing in one Dutch and five U.S. study sites. The European Commission approved LAEP2006, known by the trade name Zixtenzo, as a treatment to reduce the duration of neutropenia and incidence of febrile neutropenia that is associated with anti-cancer chemotherapy in November 2018. In breast cancer, the European Commission has approved Alaparib for the treatment of adult patients with germline BRCA1-2 mutant HER2-negative locally advanced or metastatic disease. The decision is based on findings from the Phase three Olympiad trial in which the PARP inhibitor reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 42% compared with chemotherapy in patients with germline BRCA mutant metastatic disease. With the indication, patients must have been previously treated with an anthracycline and a taxane in the neoadjuvant or metastatic setting unless they were ineligible to receive them. Additionally, those with hormone receptor positive breast cancer must have progressed on or following endocrine therapy or been ineligible for the treatment. In Olympiad, results showed the median progression-free survival was 7.4 months with Olaparib versus 4.2 months with chemotherapy, demonstrating a statistically significant improvement. Additionally, the overall response rates were 52% and 23% for elaparib and chemotherapy, respectively. The median duration of response was 6.4 months in the elaparib group and 7.1 months in the standard therapy arm. And the median time to onset of response was 47 days and 45 days, respectively. The FDA approved elaparib for this indication in January 2018. 
new evidence-based guidance statements issued by the American College of Physicians announced that women at average risk for breast cancer who are between the ages of 40 and 49 years, clinicians should have a personalized approach on whether their patients should be screened with mammography prior to the age of 50. Additionally, the guidance statement reads that those who are at average risk for breast cancer and are between the ages of 50 and 74 with no symptoms of disease should be screened with mammography biannually. These guidance statements do not apply to patients who have had prior abnormal screening results or in higher risk patients. This includes patients with a personal history of breast cancer or those who may harbor genetic mutations that are associated with increased risk, such as BRCA1-2 or another familiar breast cancer syndrome. Two additional guidance statements by the ACP state that for women who are at average risk for breast cancer and are 75 years or older, or in women who have a life expectancy of less than 10 years, breast cancer screening should be discontinued. Moreover, in average risk women of all ages, a clinical breast examination should not be used as a method to screen for breast cancer. Approximately 20% of women diagnosed with breast cancer throughout a 10-year period will be overdiagnosed and likely overtreated. Harms associated with breast cancer screening include overdiagnosis, false positive results, overtreatment, radiation exposure, as well as radiation associated breast cancers and breast cancer deaths, and anxiety and distress from the corresponding tests and procedures, which include breast biopsies. This week, we sat down with Drs. John Marshall of Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center and Tanios S. Bakai Saab of Mayo Clinic to discuss dosing strategies and patient support in metastatic colorectal cancer. Yeah, TAS-102 oral chemotherapy, cousin of 5-FU, but not 5-FU, I think. Um, not really responders either in this group. No responders. Being used in gastric and earlier lines in combination, so we're seeing it being inserted into combination regimens as chemo. So I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that this will give us a new sort of fluoropyrimidine to play with through lines of therapy. Um, you know, we do 5-FU beyond progression all the time. All the time. <laughs> and if we could show that switching it a little bit um, even helps, I think that would be positive. Well, I mean, you know, theoretically, conceptually, that this, this TAS-102 has an advantage over 5-FU in terms of protecting itself from uh, from some aspects that lead to the resistance of 5-FU. So theoretically, you would think that it may have a slight edge over 5-FU, not a significant edge, but a slight edge. And then, but who knows how that edge will work when you start combining it with uh, synergistic agents or other. Uh, it may also be more effective as a maintenance strategy on its own. There was this uh, study uh, in colorectal cancer, refractory or, or elderly colorectal cancer patients with TES-102 versus K plus, plus BEV that actually showed an edge for TAS-102 plus BEV. Now, again, you know, it needs to be reproduced. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But it was intriguing to see actually that there was a statistical, uh, I'm sorry, a significant improvement mm -hmm. uh, from TAS-102 versus capecitabine. Also so has his dosing problems too, and I, you it know, does. I've gone, you know, I've, I've sort of drunk the Kool-Aid around optimizing the dose here too. Um, and, but the pain of it is it's two pill sizes. So it's in our system, that's two prescriptions. I can't write that on one script in my, in my world. Um, and then making sure that the patient understands that it's two of these and one of these, and et cetera. It can get confusing it, to it patients. It can, and so it really requires a lot of nursing support. Uh, the other piece there is the two week on, one, two week off schedule. And I have to say a little slippery slope here is that if, if I get somebody with myelosuppression you know, coming in for cycle two, I'm pretty quick to go to an every other week kind of schedule. You think I'm wrong? What do you think? No, I, I mean, I think that ultimately, so, so the, my experience, our experience with Cape Cytabine was similar. I mean, we, the challenges of two weeks on, one week off, the challenges of two different dosages. In fact, you know, I literally, I can't recall the last time I prescribed 150 milligram. Yeah, ever. <laughs> <laughs> for Cape Cytamine. Mean, it's 500, yeah. either go down yeah, go, or, go, up, or yeah. go a little bit up if yeah. the patient is younger. Never, uh, you know, it's, it's two or three pills or four pills. That's the whole discussion. Uh, simplify is, simplifying is great. And I, I don't think it affects outcome at the end of the day. I mean, we have no idea how we got to the dosages the way they did. All we know is that on the long run, these patients do well and do really well, and you really don't have to punish them. So with TAS-102, I think an every other week regimen makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
what, it's what not, is, there's no pharmacologic there's advantage no pharm that I can figure Absolutely out. Absolutely not. I mean, yeah. think about it like this. All our fluoropyrimidines, at least the five of you, the five of you given every other week over 48 hours, and it's not even the whole week, it's two days every right. two weeks, seems to do better than a bolus 5 FU, seems to do equally well with much less toxicities than the continuous infusion. Yeah. So we know Which that is you about the same as oral. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. so we know you don't need that constant pressure yeah. and, then, and then let go. I think uh, a better measured approach would be exactly like you're doing every other week. And then I think the next question would be, do you really need those two different, can we change the dosage and can we just simplify it to just one? rather than to elderly patients. Uh, they forget to take their diabetes pill, their blood pressure pill. You think they're going to handle all this? Hey, it's tough. It's tough. I'm not even sure that they comply well with it. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.